Welcome to Money Smart for Adults, Module 2, You Can Bank on It. We're going to go through this instructor guide and highlight how you can facilitate this training. As in all other modules, it starts out here with a contents page, giving you all the information relating to this module listed by section and page number so that you know exactly where to find things here. Background information for instructors, as with other modules, is exactly the same. Starts out with a reference to the tools you'll be using to deliver the training, including the guide to presenting Money Smart for Adults. The training preparation checklist is to make sure that you have everything that's going to equip you to have a successful training. Materials you may need, as in other modules, this is a checklist of all that you're going to need to deliver the training, including the instructor guide, participant guide, and PowerPoint slides. Now, regarding the participant guide, if it's a challenge for you to give copies to everyone in your training, please refer them to the online version or some other solutions that may be appropriate. Optional materials, such as the parking lot for questions and supplies for any optional introductory activity that you may be doing, should be on hand. Understanding the icon section is the same for all the other modules in the Money Smart for Adults training. You can reference them here as a refresher if you need to. The module purpose is to cover banking services and is designed to help participants build a positive relationship with a financial institution. This module also describes financial products and services available at financial institutions, provides information on selecting financial products, services, and providers, explains basic steps for opening and managing checking and savings accounts, and describes prepaid cards, how they work, and tips for using them. The module at a glance table. We estimate that you will need three hours and 25 minutes to cover the entire module, not including breaks or any optional introductory activities. Please refer to the guide to presenting Money Smart for Adults, which includes additional information on selecting sections for specific audiences so you can further customize your training. Now this module at a glance table lists the sections, the key takeaways, the purpose, objectives, and the time estimates all laid out here for you. Module opening. Show slide one, which is the title slide of the module. As in every module in the Money Smart for Adults training, you're going to complete a few tasks such as welcoming participants as they arrive, introduce yourself, ask them to sign in, ensure any requested reasonable accommodations are in place and make any necessary adjustments. And once you're ready to begin the training, ask participants to complete the pre-training survey. Parking lot and participant guide. Establish a flip top poster for a parking lot and inform your participants that it's for questions, concerns, ideas, and resources that you'll address during breaks or at the end of training. Mention that the participant guide is theirs to use during and after the session. Encourage them to take notes and to write in them. And if time permits, start your training with an optional introductory activity. I highly recommend that you do this as it's a great way to get participants energized and ready to learn. You'll find suggestions for fun activities in the guide to presenting Money Smart for Adults or you can use your own. Section 1, Financial Products, Services, and Providers. Objectives. Participants will be able to identify financial management needs, define deposit insurance and explain its benefits, describe deposit, credit, and other services available at financial institutions, select financial products and services and providers based on personal needs and preferences. Let's pause for a moment to point out some helpful navigational features of the instructor guide. There's helpful information in the headers and footer that will help you stay oriented. In the header, the right hand side reminds you that you're looking at the instructor guide. This is helpful if you happen to also consult a copy of the participant guide during your training. The left hand side of the header identifies the section you're in. 
The footer of the document identifies the module along with the page number. These modules can seem like they all look alike, but you can always know where you are by looking at the headers and footers. You'll notice that there are facilitation instructions, say, ask, do, show slide, which are prompts to guide you through the flow of the training through the section topics. Introduction to section and key takeaway. Showing slide number three, you're introducing the section topic. Slide number four is the key takeaway. Consider your needs and shop around for financial products and services. Our first topic in this section is financial institutions, banks, and credit unions. Showing slide five, you're saying that banks and credit unions are financial institutions which offer a wide range of products and services to help you manage money and please note it also says that the term bank also includes savings and association so please make sure that you say that to participants so that they understand that it is all inclusive of savings associations in addition to this slide five is getting into the different types of accounts that people can get from these institutions also that they can borrow money um, such as uh, getting auto loans student loans getting credit cards and that they'll usually pay interest when they borrow and other fees slide number six is a comparison of the differences between banks and credit unions and that banks and credit unions are actually regulated and insured to keep your money safe and so the next section goes into deposit insurance which is the insurances that was referenced here um, in this topic slide number seven introduces the federal deposit insurance corporation or the FDIC as an independent agency of the United States government it protects the funds depositors place in FDIC insured banks now point to note since the FDIC was established in 1933, no depositor has lost a penny of FDIC insured funds. So that is a great statistic to highlight uh, for participants. In addition to that, the FDIC deposit insurance protects you if the bank fails, meaning that it is closed down by the government. Please note that the FDIC provides insurance of at least $250,000 per depositor per FDIC insured bank, per ownership category, single account, joint account, certain retirement accounts, for example. Now, if they want to know more about the FDIC, there is the website, the FDIC.gov, in addition to the FDIC's toll-free call center and the numbers listed in the instructor guide. Slide number eight introduces the National Credit Union Administration, or the NCUA, which insures deposits at credit unions. Now, the NCUA insurance is also called share insurance. Now, to verify that a credit union is NCUA insured, go to the website listed in the instructor guide or contact the toll-free number as, as listed there as well. And participants can learn more about credit unions at the website www.mycreditunion.gov and the NCUA insurance rules are similar to those of the FDIC our next topic is accessing services and financial institutions may offer access through a number of different ways their locations ATM machines customer service phone numbers and email websites mobile banking and also they can respond to reasonable accommodation requests so if a person needs that information they should simply just let the financial institution know and then they will respond accordingly to whatever accommodations that they may provide product services available at financial institutions slides 10 through 12 really goes into these particular subjects the products and services available, the deposit products, the credit products, and all of the details around that. And you'll see the scripting for that on page 16 and 17 in the instructor guide. Show slide number 13, which is 
a list of other products and services to help manage money, send money elsewhere, pay bills, for example. And so you're going to talk briefly about these other products and services with your participants. And starting with check cashing, give the participants an opportunity to define each of the terms. Now there are 10 terms listed here. Their descriptions are on pages 18 and 19 in your instructor guide. And you'll just make sure that you have a discussion about what each of these things are. Slide 14, other financial service providers. Businesses other than financial institutions also provide some financial products and services. They may extend credit or provide certain services such as cashing checks, but they generally do not accept deposits. So you're making a distinction between these financial service providers and the ones we just talked about with banks and credit unions. Now, these businesses may offer features such as being open late at night, or they may allow you to borrow money without checking your credit or verifying income. However, the products and services often cost more than similar services at financial institutions. Our next topic, what financial products and services do you need? This is actually shown on slide 15, and you're actually going to start out by asking two questions of participants. The first being, how do you choose financial products and services? The second being, how do you select a financial institution? You're going to write their responses on the flip chart or whiteboard, and of course, you're going to contribute additional information to support the discussion. Now, the important part about this particular slide is that this is a way to start thinking about financial management needs. So your participants are going to give their answers, but then you're going to come right back as listed here in the instructor guide, page 21, the second bullet point under slide 15. It says one way to ensure you're getting what you really need is to start with your financial management needs. Some people may call this your money management needs. And this is going to segue into our first activity for this section, which is to try it. What do you need to manage your money? And so you're going to read the scenario or ask a volunteer to do so. Now, this scenario is Susanna considers what she needs to manage her money. Give participants about five minutes to work in small groups to answer the questions. And after five minutes, time permitting, invite them to share their answers before providing the answers that are listed here in the instructor guide. Now, there are three questions here that really help to facilitate this discussion. The first of which, what are Susanna's financial management needs? The second question, what products or services do you think could help her address each of her needs? And the third question is, where can she get each product or service you identify? And based on how the discussion's going, you're going to contribute additional ideas as listed in the instructor guide to help with the discussion. Now, this is going to lead you into the apply it activity showing slide number 17, which is my financial management needs. You're going to give participants three minutes to complete the worksheet. And after those three minutes, you're going to ask them to share some of the financial management needs that they identified. You're going to ask them what products or services they think will address those needs, and then ask them if they would like to share where they're going to explore getting those products or services. And as you see here, this is really getting into helping them to really quantify their own financial needs based on the discussion. The next applied activity is my banking checklist. Now we're on slide 18. And this is really to help participants to think about their needs and what financial institutions offer. And really to help them to also start thinking about what they're going to do with their banking. So you're going to allow them to review that and give them an opportunity to think that through. Slide number 19 goes into the six sections that are listed on this particular activity and you'll see them there now i want you to make sure that you give them ample time to go through this because what's going to happen you're going to put them into 
pairs and to have them select one question from each of the six sections of the checklist that they think is most important. You're going to give them 10 minutes to do that. And after the 10 minutes, you're going to ask them to share what they circled and why they chose those questions. You're going to start with the first section, My Needs and Access. And as you see here in your instructor guide, you have the exact checklist that they are looking at in their participant guide. And there's this is on the next few pages here. And that will take us through our section closing, which is remembering the key takeaway, consider your needs and shop around for financial products and services. Section two, opening an account. Objectives are that participants will be able to describe the benefits of a savings or checking account, list what is generally needed to open an account with a financial institution and the steps involved, explain how banking history reports are relevant to opening a checking or savings account, explain how to get a banking history report and dispute incorrect information, and to identify options for opening an account despite challenges. So you'll introduce the section and key takeaway with slides 21 and 22, with the key takeaway being know the general process for opening a savings or checking account, including options if you are initially unable to open an account. Our first topic in this section is savings and checking accounts. And you're going to start out by asking participants a question. What are some reasons a person might want a savings or checking account? You're going to write their responses on the flip chart or whiteboard and then show slide 23, which is additional information that you can contribute to the discussion if not already mentioned by the participants. The appliant activity, my checklist for opening a savings or checking account. Please inform participants that they can use this resource after today's training to review the process for opening a savings or checking account at a financial institution. And then sl showing slide number 25, you're going to review information from the applied. Now the pages that follow gives you the scripting to say for each of the ideas on slide 25. The pages on page 33, 34, and 35 in your instructor guide. These give you the bullet points and the actual descriptions for each of these items that you'll be discussing with participants. The next section is banking history reports. You're going to get into this process that assumes that the person applying for the account is approved for the account, but everyone's not approved. So you want to emphasize to participants that this might be the reality for some people that their banking history might not allow them to get approved for opening an account. So there are some bullet points here that you can say as you facilitate this discussion, making sure that you outline this is the reality that some people may face. Now the ensuing activities. There are three applied activities that's going to follow that's really designed to help with participants that are going to have some trouble with opening accounts and it gives them a way to actually address those. So the first applied activity showing slide number 27, this is getting my banking history reports. Let participants know that they can use this after today's training to get their reports. But unlike credit reports, banking history reports generally contain only negative information. And also, that it's likely that they won't have a banking history report if there is no negative information on file. The next applied activity is filing a dispute on my banking history report. This is a resource, again, that participants can use after the training if they find incorrect information on their banking history report and they want to file a dispute. And the dispute process is basically con contains three steps with step one being file dispute with the consumer reporting company or companies reporting the error. Step two, file dispute with the financial institution that provided the information. And step three, 
rechecking your banking history report to make sure the error was corrected and that it stays corrected. The third applied activity for this section is my options for opening an account despite challenges. So you're going to review this together with the participants, but you also let them know that they can use this after today's training to identify options for opening an account if they experienced challenges opening one in the past. So showing slide number 30, you're going to talk about the five challenges that's listed there and what to consider. Now scripting for this for you is on the instructor guide pages 38, 39, and page 40 so that you have an opportunity to get into a good discussion on each of these challenges and then talk about what your participants can consider to overcome them. Section four in the training um, covers prepaid cards in more detail. So we're gonna get to that. So it's, it's coming in the future. So just let participants know that about prepaid cards, we will talk about that before you finish this particular module. Section closing is to remember the key takeaway, know the general process for opening a savings or checking account, including options if you are initially unable to open an account. Section three, managing an account. Objectives are participants will be able to explain how to manage checking and savings accounts effectively, identify parts of a check, track transactions in a register and relate this to a mobile transaction platform and explain how ATM cards, debit cards, mobile apps, and person-to-person -person transfers work. You'll introduce the section with slide 32 and the key takeaway slide 33, which is learn the rules of your account and keep track of how you use it. This can help you keep costs down and develop a positive banking relationship. Our first topic in this section is using a savings account. And here you'll be describing the differences between a savings and checking accounts, where you'll be using a savings account to build your savings by depositing money into the account and keeping it there to earn interest. And savings accounts are also designed to save money for the future. They're not designed to be used for frequent withdrawals. So please explain to participants that there may be some limitations that will require them to pay a fee for going over a certain number of transactions within a month, and that also federal law limits withdrawals from savings accounts to six withdrawals or fewer per month. And if they wanna use an account for paying bills and making purchases, a checking account is likely a better choice. So you'll have a discussion with participants about those differences. Now, the first activity in this section is apply it, managing my savings account. Showing slide 35, you're going to say, let's review some of the information in the apply it and that they could follow along in their participant guide. And this is a checklist of what they can do to actually manage their account. Showing slide number 36, you'll see five ways listed and the speaking points for each of those ways. Now wrapping that up, you'll move into using a checking account. Slide 37, you're showing that there's generally more to keep track of when managing a checking account as compared to managing a savings account. And so you'll talk about the frequent use and multiple transactions, which would be deposits, paying bills, making purchasing, and accessing cash. Showing slide 38, it gets into overdrafts, and the discussion here is about making sure participants are careful about overdrafts, and there are different ways that they might overdraw their account, and those are listed there, and you're gonna go into those particular ways. But then there is the opportunity for them to opt in to actually get those overdrafts covered for ATM and um, debit card purchases. Now under federal rules, please explain to them that they can choose whether to opt in to a program that their financial institution may offer for overdrafts caused by ATM and debit card transactions. 
So they can opt in or they can decide not to. And if they decide not to, the financial institution will decline the ATM withdrawal and debit card transaction if there's not enough funds to cover the withdrawal or purchase. And then the financial institution will not charge a fee if the transaction is declined. So for checks and other types of payments, such as automated payments, you set up to pay bills, your financial institution chooses whether to cover the check or transaction that will cause you to exceed your balance. Now, if they decide it will cover it, expect a charge or an overdraft fee. If the financial institution decides not to cover the transaction, they can charge non-sufficient funds fee and the merchant may also charge you a return check fee. So these fees can vary, but fees of $30 or more are common. So very important to know that these things exist. And there's a table on page 26 in the participant guide that summarizes what you just talked about for that. So participants can really go through that and review about overdrafts and fees. Show slide 39, and this is a real life example. Rodney has $50 in his checking account and he's opted into the overdraft program. So the overdraft fees are $35 for its account. So you're going to have participants go through this, this particular example. You're going to talk about on March 1st, he spends $15 on a birthday cake for his daughter and $25 on gas, but he forgot that he authorized the phone company to auto pay his phone bill on the first of every month, and that bill is $45. Depending upon the order in which Rodney's financial institution processes these charges, one or two of them will be overdrafts. If it processes the birthday cake and gas purchases first, the phone bill will be an overdraft resulting in a $35 fee. If it considers the phone bill to be the first or second transaction of the day, then there will be two overdraft fees of $35 for a total of $70. So it's important for participants to know that it's really going to depend on the order in which these transactions are processed, which will determine how many times they may be charged a fee for the overdraft. Slide 40 is going into direct deposits. Now, this is a feature associated with checking accounts to consider, which is the direct deposit, automatic bill payment and automatic debit. Slide 41 goes into the automatic bill payment and automatic debit details and you'll follow the scripting there to talk about that. One note here is that the key to using automatic bill payments or automatic debits is to make sure that there's enough money in the account to cover the payments when they're made. That's what you want to emphasize to participants to make sure that they have the money there to cover. The next activity is try it, learning the parts of a check. This is on page 27 in the participant guide and you'll ask them to take a look at this and what we're gonna do is to go and look at all 12 sections here as pointed out and to identify what these are. You're gonna get them into pairs so that they can pair up with a partner and take five minutes to identify each part of the example check. But you'll start out by asking a question, what is number one on the check? Then, once the answer is given, you can give them five minutes to complete the exercise in pairs. On page 49 and 50 in your instructor guide is the actual key, the answer key, for the answers of the 12 parts of a check. And so you can refer to that as you are having your discussion with your participants. The next activity is the apply it, managing my checking account. So the conversation up to this point was really designed to get participants to get in the frame of mind that there is a level of management that they must do to make sure that their checking account stays in good status. And so you're going to review the information from the Apply It Together. And this is a, a checklist of ways. And you'll see on slide 45, this is the beginning of the checklist. And on page 51 and 52 of the instructor guide, 
and also page 53, you'll see that there are descriptions of what to say for each of these ways to manage a checking account. And so that will cover slides 45, slide 4. After the discussion on managing their checking account, you're going to go into the next activity, which is try it using a transaction register. Showing slide 47, you're going to ask participants to turn there and to start thinking about how to manage a register. Read it or ask a participant or volunteer to do so. Now the scenario is ASIF uses a transaction register to manage his checking account and then give them 10 minutes to work with a partner to actually complete ASIF's transaction register and answer the questions. And after each transaction, they're going to calculate the balance and enter it in the final column. And after the 10 minutes is over, you're going to provide answers to the questions using the answer key shown. And here you'll see the answer key here in the instructor guide, and it's also listed on the slide 48. Now we're going to go into the mobile app. Now the design here of this next try it activity is to also look at how the mobile app is actually tracking these same transactions that is in ASIF's transaction register. But notice here, and this is for you to understand that as you get into this exercise with participants, that the mobile app balance reflects that the $500 rent check has not been processed. Okay, And there is a double entry of the $50 transaction on April 3rd. So please make a note of that because the app is going to really reflect these items and you want participants to make sure that they see that and catch it. So you're going to have a discussion with them and you're going to ask a question which transaction from the list of recent transactions is missing from ASIF's mobile app screen and why? Then you're going to ask which transaction is incorrect. The next topic is automated teller machine cards or, or ATM cards. Showing slide number 50, you're going to list out all of the descriptions of an ATM card and its features. Then on Slide number 51, you'll talk about debit cards and its features. Now, there are differences between the two, which a debit card can do all the things that an ATM card can do, but a debit card can actually make purchases because they actually have a card network logo on them. And so that's the differences, and you want to make sure that participants understand what those are. Our next topic is person-to-person -person payments, or P2P payments. You may hear P2P referred to as peer-to-peer -peer as well as person-to-person. -person. Now, this is a very popular feature or service that's emerging that a lot of people like to use. And so showing slide 52, you're going to have a discussion about this. And go ahead and consider sharing the names of common P2P apps or asking participants to name the apps that they know about or use. Now, what's important about P2P apps is things that you should keep in mind when using them. First of all, is it through a federally insured financial institution? Fees, privacy, funds availability, and rights and dispute resolution. There are speaking points for each of these topics here. Um, regarding P2P apps, make sure to go over those with your participants and facilitate that discussion because, again, it is an emerging service that's happening with a lot of financial institutions. A lot of people are using these, very popular, but you want to make sure that they understand all these other elements. Mobile wallet apps show slide number 53. And this is a type of mobile app that some people like to use along with their debit card, but also they could use it with their credit card as well. And what happens is they enter that information into the app, and at point of sale purchases, they can use their app instead of using the card itself. So very, very useful feature, 
in case people don't like to carry their cards around, they can just have it in the app and use the app. There is a website, onguardonline.gov, for tips to keep your mobile device secure. So make sure to emphasize that website for participants. And then we move on to the section closing, which is remembering the key takeaway. Learn the rules of your account and keep track of how you use it. This can help you keep costs down and develop a positive banking relationship. Section 4, Prepaid Cards. The objectives are participants will be able to explain how a prepaid card works, list common features of prepaid cards, and list tips for using prepaid cards effectively. Show slide 55 and 56 introducing the section and the key takeaway. The key takeaway being prepaid cards allow you to spend or access money loaded onto them. They usually aren't linked to a checking or savings account. Before you use one, review its features and fees. How prepaid cards work. Show slide 57 and you're going to say that a prepaid card is different from a debit card. A prepaid card is not linked to an account at a financial institution. So you'll explain what a prepaid card is and some of the reasons how people actually use them. Prepaid cards are widely available from financial institutions and other businesses that can be purchased in person or online. And to access all the prepaid card features and benefits, you must register the card. These features and benefits might include protections related to the loss or theft of the card. Show slide 58. We're talking about the different kinds of prepaid cards. Those include reloadable prepaid cards and payroll cards. An electronic benefit transfer or EBT card is a prepaid card used by government agencies to pay certain government benefits such as disability benefits or unemployment insurance. Some, but not all, college or university identification cards are also prepaid cards. Our next activity, try it, what fees are common to reloadable prepaid cards? Show slide 60 and you're going to allow participants to think about their use of prepaid cards and to be sure they know what fees they may have to pay and how they can be able to Reading the cardholder agreement is important for understanding the fees for a given prepaid card and may help participants identify ways to avoid those fees. Now, not all cards have fees, so let's look at some fees that you may see as they're shopping around for a prepaid card. So give them two minutes to complete this exercise. They're going to put a check next to the prepaid card fees that they think are charged by at least some prepaid cards. After two minutes, tell participants that all of the fees listed are real fees charged by at least some reloadable prepaid cards and encourage participants to understand the fees of prepaid cards they have or are considering getting. The packaging of prepaid cards and card provider websites are great places to start. Now, please note the following explanations on page 68 in the instructor guide all the way through page 69 use those explanations when you're talking to participants about clarification on specific fees and you'll see them for monthly fees transaction fee account or card reload fee bill payment fee ATM withdrawal fees balance inquiry fees additional card fees inactivity fee lost or stolen card replacement fee and fee for canceling the card and their respective descriptions Again, use those descriptions that you see underneath each of those headers there for those fees and use those to explain to participants exactly what they are. The next activity is try it, a prepaid card or a bank account. Now, this is going to use a scenario with Lucia, and I want you to understand that this scenario presents two choices to illustrate similarities and differences. In reality, Lucia does not need to choose either one or the other. She could have both a prepaid card and a bank account with a debit card. Okay, so the scenario is just to look at the two and when participants are thinking about 
deciding whether they should get a prepaid card or a bank account, this is going to help them to think through that. So go ahead and read the scenario or ask a participant or volunteer to do so. Break the participant up into small groups. Assign half of the groups the first question and the other half the second question and give them five minutes to discuss the answer to their assigned question. After five minutes, time permitting, invite participants to share their answers before providing the answers that follow. Now, the first question is, why might Lucia want to use a reloadable prepaid card instead of opening a bank account that provides a debit card? So one group is going to answer that question. The other group is going to answer this question. Why might Lucia want to open a bank account and use a debit card instead of using a reloadable prepaid card? So you'll have that discussion with both groups and again contributing uh, the possible answers that's listed in the instructor guide if they're not already contributed. The applied activity that follows is reloadable versus debit. Which card is right for me? And so this is something that they can do after today's training uh, to compare a reloadable prepaid card and a debit card to help them figure out what the right option is for them. And just gives them an opportunity to think about this while making a decision. The next slide, 63, is lost or stolen prepaid cards. So talk about that. Slide 64 is tips for using prepaid cards. And that's how you end this particular section with the remembering of the key takeaway, which is prepaid cards allow you to spend or access money loaded onto them. They usually aren't linked to a checking or savings account. Before you use one, review its features and fees. Module closing. Say to participants, remember the key takeaways from the sections covered in the training. Then show slide 66, encouraging them to take action. Every module has the same take action activity. It's important not to skip it even if you can only spare a couple of minutes. The participants will remember what you just presented a lot easier if they can write down a few action steps. Knowledge isn't enough, action is required. Show slide 67 and thank participants for attending and ask them to complete the post-training survey. You may decide to compare the post-training to the pre-training survey to estimate knowledge gains of the entire group or for each participant. Use the answer key for both the pre- and post-training survey here on page 77 in the instructor guide. And you see here where this module and its focus is listed among the other modules in the training. This will conclude our overview and highlights of the instructor guide for Money Smart for Adults Module 2, You Can Bank on It.